Okay, people. Okay, my name is Chris Bambry. I've been asked to moderate this uh, session. My position is one of, it's in suspension at the moment. I'm the public contact point for the all-party parliamentary group on Catalonia, which until the 8th of June does not exist because there are no MPs and the, the vagaries of the British Constitution. Uh, I'm also an author of uh, the provocatively titled The Second World War, A Marxist History, and, and I've got an article coming up in Military History Monthly on the, bar the bombing campaign again. Uh, but one of the reasons I would uh, also very pleased to speak today and one of the reasons why when I was asked this morning whether this event should go ahead is my mother volunteered in 1939 along with my father but my mother served in the ATS, the Women's Army, as a searchlight operator in London during the Blitz of 1940-41. And the picture she painted was one of suffering, yes, but also people having a normal life. For instance, up all night during the bombing but at lunchtime going for dances, and my mother talking about the number of free French, Norwegians, Canadians, South Africans, very eligible young men in London at that time and the fun they had. And I think it's important to remember in the context of today that they were trying to carry on a normal life in the face of evil, and I think we should do the same, because to do otherwise is to surrender to that evil. Uh, I should also add, just in a little personal note, I remember back in the 1960s when holidays abroad became a feature of British life and the Costa Brava was one of the areas people went to. Both my mum and dad explaining to me we would not be going on holiday to Spain. Certainly not until Franco died and the end of the dictatorship. And I'm pleased to say I never did visit Spain until after the death of Franco. Now having got that off my chest, I would like to introduce our two speakers. Apologies from Mirella Boyer, who unfortunately can't be with us today. But we have we are very lucky to have Joan Joseph Nuit, who's going to be our first contributor, followed by Montserrat Pailly. So I'd like to introduce you, Joan. First of all, I would like to thank very warmly the organizers of this workshop, DiploCAD as well as the European Observatory for Memories, the Universidad de Barcelona. And, well, I would like to thank you all, those who have participated in the organization to this seminar. Thank you very much for having invited us. I'm the speaker of my political party in a parliament commission, in the Catalan parliament, the Commission on External Affairs, that deals that depend on the government department. The Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Catalan government was also the Minister for Memory Public Policies. My mother is today 91 years old, and she will be 92 very soon. As you know, all people sometimes don't remember about what had yesterday for supper, but they have very vivid memories about events that took place many, many years ago. And my mother always remember a fatidic date in the city where I was born, which is Reus in the south of Catalonia. Today, Reus has more than 100,000 inhabitants, but back in 1938, it had only 32,000 inhabitants. It was back then considered a civil war in Catalonia context. In January 24, an Reus. Reus had a shelter what today it's called the Freedom Square, a shelter, a, a square that was called the Square of the Martyrs. And, well, they placed, in fact, a fascist monument in the middle of the square. And in this Freedom Republican Square, the biggest shelter of Reus was built for more than 3,600 people. Back then, on January the 21st, when the alarms announced that 
planes were approaching from Mallorca, the refuge was full, of course, but unfortunately one of the bombs hit the entrance of the shelter. Forty people died and hundreds were injured, badly injured. Some of these injured died in the later hours. And my mother's brother died, Joseph Pujols, so my uncle. And at home, we have always remembered him and his loss. He was 17 years old back then. He was a civilian, a non-mobilized civilian. And my family will always remember him with great affection. The fascist bombardments in Catalonia really marked the civil war and the perception that many Catalans, many Republican Catalans had. People that, well, were part of the front line, that, who, who never was part of the front line, maybe their brother, their their, their husbands were in the front line. They were rear guard, and the bombings was the experience that really marked their experience about the civil war and the warfare conflict. It used to be said in the past in Barcelona more than 2,500 people died as a result of the bombings, but in the rest of Catalonia, twice as much people died, and many Catalan cities were bombed. Of course, Barcelona was badly bombed, but also Lleida, Tarragona, Granollers. Granollers' mayor is amongst us today. Also, Figueras in the north of Catalonia, Reus in the south, San Vicente, Caldes, Flix, Elcana, or Tortosa. Many other cities were bombed. All these cities were bombed with different aims. The first aim, well, the first target were, was cities in which industrial production was taking place, cities that could be somehow related to the war in Reus, there was a factory, an important factory, to assemble and repair Russian aircraft. So it was a clear target for the fascist aviation. There were also communication nodes. Reus was a communication node as well as other cities. They also bombed energy sources like electric plants, hydro plants, which were, of course, badly hit by the bombings. And the civil population suffered as a result of these bombings as well. Some of the facilities was left intact, but many, many people around those facilities died. And another objective of the bombings was to threaten the civil population. Our previous speaker said that the battle for the morale became in the civil in the Spanish Civil War and later on during the Second World War the most important battle let's all remember that the Spanish Civil War was only a short test for the Second World War a environment where to test military techniques that were later on implemented large scale during the Second World War. So as I said before, one of the objectives of these bombings was to threat the civil population to undermine their morale. For many, many leaders, this battle against the people's morale was even more important that, than destroying actual infrastructures. And I would like to read some examples to you. I would like to share some examples from, for example, General Mola, Emilio Mola, who in his memories on April the 2nd, 1937, he wrote a very significant sentence. He said, Spain is dominated by the Catalan and the Bilbao industry in order to make Spain healthy again, we need to destroy all this industry. So Catalan and Basque industrial networks was a clear target. General Bellardi received a telegram from Rome, the head of the Italian aviation in charge of bombing Barcelona and other Catalan cities, 
as well as Valencia. Well, this general received a telegram from Rome saying, start as of tonight ac violent actions against Barcelona with systematic bombing throughout all the night. What does that exactly mean, all the night? Well, the objective was not necessarily to destroy a specific facility or industrial factory. The, the Franco Secret Service detailed more than 220 targets in Barcelona, which were potentially interesting for the fascist aviation. So there was a whole spectrum of the city that could be, let's say, hit and destroyed. But the target was to undermine people's morale, not necessarily destroying all these military targets. It was about threatening the civil population to, let's say, not let them know when the bombs would actually hit them. So the psychological impact was massive. And many, many people like my mother, when they remember the civil war, especially all those who were in the rear guard, is precisely the impact of these bombings, the psychological impact of all these bombings. It was horrible for many, many Catalans in these rear guard cities. I would like to say, in order to conclude this first intervention and let or give the floor to my colleague, to my MP colleague, Monse Palau, I would like to say that, honestly, the bombings that took place in Catalonia are a horrific event of the Spanish Civil War. We are totally convinced that we need to remember them today even more than ever. There is a positive side to it, even if it's tricky to use the word positive here, right? My city, Reus, became or was at the vanguard you know, to defend its civil population. That was a very important event that took place. The building of the anti-airstrike shelters in Reus was the result of the active role of the civil population. And that's quite significant. This was led by trade unions with the participation of millions and mi thousands of men and women who participated in building these shelters, which are still there. And they are amazing civil engineering works that way we can all visit and we should all remember because it allows us to understand how terrified the civil population was. So it's important to remember them all. The Catalan parliament is deeply committed with public memory policies. As you know, the Spanish democracy is weak, and one of its imperfections after 40 years of dictatorship has to do with not underlying sufficiently the memory and the rescue of the Republicans that died fighting for freedom those who offer their lives to fight against fascism, to defend themselves, and during the Franco period to get organized and set up a resistant, resisting group against fascism and fascism. New regulations will be passed shortly in the Catalan parliament to give rights and freedoms, not to those who fought because they are all almost all dead, but to their relatives who have the right to know where they are, to remember those who fought Franco, because they were heroes. They were heroes who said no to fascism, and we should always have them at heart. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much also to the organizers for your kind invitation. And thank you very much for your kind words. First of all, I would like to say something which is very obvious, but also very clear. You, people in London and Great Britain, you won the war, and we 
Republican and Democrat Catalonia lost the war. So you, your democracy fought and won over fascism. And fascism as a military coup was part of our country causing a war. And since then, we spent more than 40 years of a cruel, furious repression, very difficult. And I'm saying that because here we gather many researchers, many university specialists, and you always from the very beginning, since 1946, 1947, you have been able to do some research in a very scientific and rigorous way about a series of facts. But we couldn't do it until post-democracy, because 1976 and 1978, there were many books on the history of war and post-war that had to be edited in exile with editorials in foreign countries. And until very recently, we have not been able to read many of these research. Luckily, we have many and very good ones, such as the representation that we have here. Second thing I would like to say, I would like to touch upon, and maybe talking about my colleague who started talking about his mother, and this is a more professional question maybe, if we take a look at archives on memory, oral and written archives of history, if we take a look at what we call the biographies and memories of different people, there are a couple of things which we can hear repeatedly all the time. And I'm referring to what my colleague was saying, two things which mark a trauma, especially according to my consultation with women and the rear guard, which are a terrible consequence for the population. One, the bombings, and the other ones, the entry of the fast faces troops, so the defeat of the war. In different research groups, and with the group of research of Ramon Arnabat, who is going to address you later on after lunch, and he will present all the interactive and interesting map. We presented a couple of years of work at the University of Glasgow about trauma, nostalgia, and memory, which is centered in women who suffer this civil war in Catalonia. And as you will understand, in the rear guard until the entry of the fascist troops. And there was hunger, there was violence, but the predominant facts are the impact suffered due to the bombing and the entry and the defeat of the fascist troops. Among other papers, if I take a look at the discourse of these archives and these sources from women who lived through the war, the most repeated words are fear, suffering, being afraid of not to be able to withstand the situation, shaking, crying, worrying, terror, panic, disaster, hell, death, tension, and horror. And they many, many times. Let me start by this panic and terror and being afraid of bombs, although you will talk about it later, whether you are from Barcelona or Catalonia or you are from London. And I would like to talk about this bombarding. These were systematic bombardings which had not happened before in our country, and not even the military authorities could know about the consequences. And in my region, especially, although Noet has already mentioned that, which are the regions of Camp de Tarragona and the south of Catalonia, what we call Camp de Tarragona and Terras de Lebra. The first bombs that dropped in Catalonia were precisely in this territory. Flish, on the 23rd and 24th of February, 1937. And uh, it has been said here, there was a military objective, there was a manufacturing site, but the bombs fell in the middle of the population, so indiscriminate attack, and the manufacturing site continued to work, but personal damage were highly costly. A couple of days later, bombs on Tortosa, and in March, bombarding all over Catalonia, the north, Tremp, Badalona, next to Barcelona, or once again over Tortosa. February 1937, 
in the region of Tarragona, Terras de Lebra. They suffer attacks practically of all the existing modalities of warfare and with bombardings which were coming from powerful planes, tri-motors, bi-motors, and hydroplanes. These hydroplanes were unknown in my region, and people started to talk about them, such as Hydros, Hydros, Hydros Isidro, which is a name, a popular name, which is the Catholic and Saint patron of uh, people who work in the fields. And usually people started to talk about uh, hydroplanes. They call them Isidros, which is a popular name in Spain. So that was something which has never been seen before. Yes, it is true. It has been said in the conference by the previous specialist. There were some alerts. And the first orders in Tarragona on the 12th of October 1936, where they were alerting the population of possible bombardings, and they were given some advice, of course, and instructions. If they hear the sirens, they should turn off the lights, they should close themselves in the house, not to walk around the street. But these recommendations were about things that will never happen. They thought they will never happen. And that was August, sorry, October, she says, of 1936. March 1937, the bombarding started to be systematic. During the first days, people thought that everything would continue the same. It will be just uh, anecdote. And they also thought that they will not bombard the civil population. And they were completely naive in this sense. And since then, they started to organize themselves. And as my colleague has said, they started to create this refuge. I don't know if you are well of Tarragona, the Tarraco Imperial. And in Tarragona, we were able to use a series of archaeological tunnels between the circus, the forum, the amphitheater, the Roman theater, which were underground corridors where people could hide. We're talking about a city of 34,000 inhabitants. Many of them flew to the countryside. And although we tried to keep a normal situation, life was not longer normal. It was not longer normal because, for example, one year after the war, 19th of July, 1937, Tarragona, 34 bombs. The following day, 15, 15 kilometers away, Torre de Embarra, 3,000 inhabitants, 25 bombs, creating a terrible situation, especially Italian and German bombing. Uh, the sirens were not working. The air defense was not enough, and there was a lack of shelter among many of these regions. Let me tell you some examples. In the city of Tarragona, Aviacio Legionaria Italia, Legio Condor Germany, and Brigada Hispana de Bombarderos. In Tarragona, 144 attacks by 500 and Detroit Falset which was known as the Catalan Guernica, a beautiful place, a small place, a small village. Falset, I don't know if you're aware of this place. You must be aware of the wines of the Priorat. If you don't know them, I invite you to taste them because they're very nice. And I'm saying that because Falset and the regions next to Falset are full of citizens, British citizens, who come to visit, not only with the excuse of the wines, but also they like to visit and travel through the paths of their uh, family members of these international brigades and also all the museums that have been built around the Battle of Ebro. Since our moderator has also talked about women, let me talk very briefly about the British nurses the British nurses who not only due to their daily work, but also because of their teachings by training Spanish nurses, Catalan nurses, international nurses who were at the front of the Ebra. A couple of them 
who had an honor with her patients, Etne and Ada Hudson. And I recommend you the studies by Angela Jackson, who wrote a doctoral thesis, British Woman and the Spanish Civil War. It has been published in English, Rutledge, 2002. And I also recommend you another essay, which is Beyond the Battle Front, Testimony Memory of uh, Hospital of the Spanish Civil War in Catalan and in English. And in 2007, one novel by Angela Jackson, which is called Warm Earth. And you have it also in both languages. Angela Jackson continues to live in El Priorat, and she's one of the activists of these spaces of historic model, and she's still involved in the preservation of this historic memory from an association which is called Don't Give Up on Memory. And from here, 1938, another terrible fact I was mentioning, the bombs on the one hand during the war and the entry of the fascist troops at the end of the war and the beginning of repression, 40 years of darkness, terror, impune killing, and systematic repression against individual freedoms and national freedoms, an absolute demophobia. And people who live through this experience, or has done some research on this experience, often we are going through the attitudes. And I tell my students, date. And people who live through this experience, or has done some research on this experience, often we are going through the attitudes, statements, and behaviors of the current Spanish government. Recently, and sometimes uh, the university, I teach Catalan literature of the 20th century, and I cover the period of the pre-war and the war. And recently, I tell my students to take some articles or these courses. I read them to my students. And in the end, I tell them, what media do they come from? What date? And my students say, from that media, that media, but 2016, 2017, they say, 2015. And then I tell them, no. This is in this media, this other media, but it's 1937, 1938, 1941. This could seem like an anecdote, which I can tell you about my classes by playing with these discourses, but you also have a report in English, which has been published by the Ombudsman of Catalonia, in which there is a whole study about the democratic regression of the Spanish state nowadays. You have it online in Catalan, Spanish, and English. I recommend you to read it. And talking about this historical memory, let me also tell you to conclude that the spokesman of the UN, Pablo de Grave, as he did in 2014, he's doing it again in 2017. He has officially requested the Spanish state to listen to the petitions of the victims of Frankism and the Franco regime to give priority to these burials and to reconsider, we mentioned that before, El Valle de los Caídos to cancel the court sentences adopted during dictatorship. 2014-16, the UN spokesman continues under the same situation and will continue the same as far as the Spanish government. No gesture in favor of historical memory, not an euro of budget, and never, as Germany did, we have ever requested uh, forgiveness, just the opposite. They have not requested forgiveness. A couple of days ago, there was the burial of uh, Minister of Franco, someone who had been a minister under Franco, and we saw the burial with everybody raising their arms and singing fascist hymns. 
such as Cara al Sol. Therefore, these things are happening. We are going through a regression. We are kind of traveling back in time, but this is terrible towards anti-democratic and dictator times. Let me conclude by telling you that we are here, those of you who are specialists on bombarding at the time that we don't want these facts to happen again. We are here to remember uh, people who have been buried in these non-identified forces, people who were brought to court, who were taken to concentration camps. In summary, let's don't repeat that and let's remember above all with other um, policies of memories that this is the will of so many victims and so many people who die for democracy. And we are those who have inherited the rights of those people who fought in favor of democracy and peace. Thank you very much. Well, we've got 15, 20 minutes for contributions and questions. So I'm going to throw the floor open to you. And uh, time on our man, I'll just put your hand up in the air and I'll call you. As always, there's a silence at the beginning, but good. Hello. Can you hear me? So good morning, everyone. I'm Marina Falco. I'm the Director of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations sorry, for the Catalan government. Uh, first of all, saying I'm delighted to be here uh, in London. It's a country, sorry, it's a city I consider home. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to be here commemorating uh, these events. So thank you to the organizers for, for this. Um, I also would like to take the opportunity, actually, to express the condolences in the name of the Catalan government for the terrible, terrible attacks uh, that happened in Manchester. Sorry, my, my voice breaks a little bit as I say that because I woke up this morning with this news and I'm still shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated that these people with these acts of terrorism still manage somehow to spread the fear amongst our populations. And, and so somehow the fact that we are here talking about this today is, as you were saying, uh, Chris, um, an act of no matter what we do, we are going to fight against this and we are carrying on with our lives. So um, congratulations as well for this. Uh, I just wanted to do a contribution. It's not a question, um, as I couldn't talk earlier, um, but a little bit in line with uh, the, the colleagues, uh, Mr. Nuet and Mrs. Palau. Um, they have both remarked uh, how uh, everyone pretty much in Catalonia has memories in their families of uh, what happened during the Civil War. We all have relatives that somehow suffered it. My, you have explained your examples. I also have several examples in my family. Um, and I want to point out what Ms., uh, Mrs. Palau just said, that it's so sad that the, the Spanish government uh, still has not, to this date, um, condemned any of the atrocities that happened during uh, the Civil War, as unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable as this may sound. Um, but I think it's also important to remark that, contrary-wise, the Catalan government actually do so. Um, I think uh, I can say that we have the conviction that it is our obligation towards our people and those who suffer in our country um, to actually establish public policies towards this historical memory. And it's actually one of our priorities, uh, actually, in the department that I represent, the Department of uh, it's called uh, Foreign Affairs, but also Institutional Relations and Transparency. And historical uh, memory is something that we put a lot of effort on. Uh, we undertake this task um, with the main aim to recover and to commemorate such um, historical events like the ones we are talking about today, uh, but also to remember and to homage um, all those who were victims for ide ideological reasons, uh, all those that suffered repression during the 40 years of the Franco dictatorship, all those that um, were, had to go in exile. <laughs> I have examples in my family of that as well. Uh, and especially those who were deported to prisons and concentration camps. Uh, actually, my colleague uh, Albert Royo in his speech was mentioning that just two weeks ago, we actually were in Mauthausen, the Nazi concentration camp in Austria, where 3,000 Catalans were deported and about 1,200 died there. Uh, also a few English people were there. Uh, so we were there not just to kind of commemorate, but also to remember what these people fought for. Uh, they fought to make sure that 
we would live nowadays in a more free and more democratic society. It is very important to remember this every day, and especially to do it amongst young people, uh, people that perhaps they don't have fresh memories as we do, but it's important that they go there and they experience and they understand what happened. So, because we think that actually by remembering these events, hopefully there will be less chances of them happening again, of these young people kind of recreating them again. So that's why it's so important to work in this uh, historical memory. In terms of our policies, um, of our programs, the ones that we develop as, um, as Catalan government, I also would like to mention a little bit what we do. Um, we, we run very specific programs, uh, such as, for example, the, the creation of a database that, uh, of former political prisoners. Uh, we have a, a project to search and identify war victims in burial pits. Uh, also, Mike Albert was mentioning before how we have all these people that were killed during the war, and now they are buried, spread all over different roads, and no one knows where these pits are, and we are so weird to have a specific project trying to find where these people are and trying to, to find out who, uh, and match with all these list of disappeared people. And we are all running, also, we are running and we have developed a, a genetic identification program, which actually is considered one of the pioneers in, in Europe. And thanks to that, we have managed to do this match with this list of disappeared people and the ones and the, the remainings that we are finding um, in these burial pits, so at least families know where they are and can bury them in, in proper conditions. Uh, alongside, we are also working in the promotion of historical memory by doing workshops, by doing conferences. We have a witness video recording series, all these especially targeted to young people, as I was saying before, because they are the ones that are important to, to, to recollect these, these stories and this memory. Um, I'm saying all that just to illustrate that, how the Catalan government believes uh, that this is necessary to exercise and recognize and dignify the memory, and that's why debates like the ones we're having here today are so important. So um, just uh, helping, um, sorry, so just thanking all of you today for being here and uh, really looking forward to everyone else's contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? Thank you very much. Um, if you don't mind, I'll ask the question in Catalan, which is my mother tongue. So, um, I would like to ask the speakers, what is the support of the parliament on a bill presented by Esquerra Republicana de Catalonia to withdraw Franco symbols in Catalan municipalities, which unfortunately, well, the civil population these are the citizens of these villages who've had to remove these signs with using their own tools and, you know, withdrawing all these symbols, these Franco symbols. The censors of these Franco signs have been carried out by, let's say, the citizenship because Year 2007, unbelievable, but we still find Franco signs scattered around the territory. This would be my first question, both for, for, for both MPs, Catalan MPs. What is the reaction of the Catalan Parliament and the Commission on Memory about the referendum of the Tortosa Monument? I don't know if our international, our English guests are aware of that. In Tortosa, there is a massive Franco monument with a massive bird that has been there for ages in the middle of the river, of the Ebro River. And the parliament asked for its withdrawal, but unfortunately, the city mayor, Germa Bell, well, they launched a local referendum to ask Tortosa citizens whether they wanted to withdraw the monument or not. And the citizens decided not to withdraw the monument. So how does how is going the how is the parliament going to react to such referendum? Well, first of all, regarding the first question, we are in a process of withdrawing Franco signs in Leda. For example, the city mayor asked citizens to get their tools and get started. I think this is positive. This is participatory, right? Uh, in other 
cities. It's the city council who is in charge of withdrawing them, such as in Tarragona. In Tarragona, the mayor is socialist from the Socialist Party. And in Tarragona, the withdrawal of, of all these Franco symbols has already started. So it really depends. Of course, there is a very vast will to withdraw them. All these citizens who are deeply mobilized are very active and we really embrace this participation. We need to keep going. It's easy in small towns, in bigger cities it's a little bit more difficult. The parliament, the Catalan parliament, voted on this bill you mentioned in order to withdraw this big monument in Tortosa, this Franco monument in Tortosa, yeah, to be demolished. But even if some political parties abstained in the voting, because they argued that democracy, local democracy, should prevail. And there was a referendum foreseen a few months later, a referendum in which the mayor asked whether citizens wanted to demolish the monument or not. And the question was, would you like to demolish the monument or, let's say, reconvert it? It's just horrifying. Every time you drive past it, it's horrifying. Well, this is an outstanding topic. Our bill on historic memory will someday force them to demolish it because it's a regional bill. All political parties, almost all political parties, except for the more modern ones, have been in office in Tortosa, all of them. They have had the possibility to develop memory policies and none of them has. So we should take that into account. Sometimes we name and shame others, but we are also cowards when it comes to taking these dignifying measures. So careful with that, I would say. Let's all remember also as I said at the beginning of my presentation, you won the war, we lost the war, and there was a terror climber started by deep silence. Then we moved into the, well, if you don't speak about it, it will not even exist. And now we're in a third stage in which we are somehow re-experiencing this trauma, this shock. So younger generations are the brave ones, are the ones that can somehow start from scratch. In many homes, in many families, people didn't even know that our grandparent is missing. No one said anything. Well, he died in war, don't say anything. Silence was imposed during Franco's dictatorship. So let's be optimistic. Let's enforce this bill on memory and let's put an end to impunity. Absolutely. Well, I would like to echo my colleague's words. Let's all remember that the traumatism, the trauma caused by war and the dictatorship has been a long-lasting effect hunger, repression. Let's bear in mind, by the way, that the period after war was marked by hunger. Many, many people were starving. As Montsepalau said, in many families, no one wanted even to mention the relatives who went missing during the war. And that's why it's extremely important to promote sound public policies, memory policies, because we need to carry out a collective task to overcome this trauma and reinterpret this historical period. It needs to be said that both the Bill on Historic Memory from 2007 
and another bill from 2016 should not make it possible for the Tortosa monument to keep standing. The bill of the Spanish parliament bans fascist and Franco signs, and so does the Catalan parliament bill. Of course, the demolishment of this monument is not easy. It's not a small thing. It's a massive structure in the middle of the Ebro River. So, you know, even the Valle de los Caídos is quite polemic because the reinterpretation of this fascist monument is, is not easy to carry, it, carry out. But still, we need to put it on the table because if such massive visual signs are not debated, well, they will be integrated in our society and fascist symbols will become normal in a democracy that shouldn't be the case. And the law so states that. So my personal position is that the Tortosa monument needs to be gone soon. Let me finish by saying that the historic memory bill passed in 2007 was an important step forward. It was a milestone, in, for, in fact. But it left two stones unturned, let's say. On the first hand, the people that went missing in Spain, there is a debate about how many people went missing. It's between 100,000 and 110,000 that were buried anonymously in the middle of nowhere, oftentimes in the same very place where they were shot in the middle of a road near cemeteries. So this is a fact. This is a terrible fact. And it means that any democratic country that faces such past reality cannot reconcile with its democratic history. So we need to overcome this. In Catalonia, this is a small percentage because, of course, a while ago, the Catalan government developed or passed a bill on this sense that really helped dignify these missing people. And on the other hand, we need to talk about Franco trials. Only in Catalonia, 70,000 people were judged in military courts and in a few hours and without any previous ruling, they were judged, condemned, and executed in many cases. More than 3,600 people were executed. And these regulations, these, well, they have not been banned. Catalonia is now promoting a bill to revert the situation because these people that were executed were not criminals. They were heroes who fought for freedom in Catalonia. Well, indirectly, complex realities without being really acquainted with these complex realities. We need to first understand and then act. This is a process, and memory is a process. And sometimes the process is even more interesting than the outcome. The report, the report that we carried out, the non-binding non -binding report that we carried out with the support of experts from different fields, well, the recommendation was the following. It was recommended that the 212 Franco monuments to, well, to be kept and not destroyed because they allow us to understand the situation. They allow us to understand the period. The first monument we assessed was the one in Porbo, right in the front, in the border with France and beyond the exile memorial, we maintain this Port Beau monument in the, for young people, in the, for citizens to understand the importance of Port Beau in the total occupation of Catalonia. So I would say this didactic task is now over. And I'm a 
big defender of this heritage because it helps us educate our youth people. Having said that, I am extremely interested in reparation policies, so let's not make the mistake of acting without knowing, because sometimes we do. Um, we need to ca be brave. We need to carry out long-term memory policies and allocate a sound budget to memory policies. And you know that. The government knows it. Experts know it. We need, we need a budget to understand what a symbol is about. So that's a reflection I want to share with you. There have been commissions. Articles have been published. We have now some maps. We have now some databases. We've been talking about databases, open databases, in fact. So we have all the lists which are published in different websites. There is no, well, war councils by region, by provinces. And, you know, articles have been published in the sense so I urge you to act on the basis of knowledge. Public policies are very necessary, but they need to be well informed on evidence. As mayor and representative of a Catalan village, and as a person who is more or less acquainted with the sensitivity of mayors around historic memory, I would say that most Catalan villages have done their homework and withdrawn Franco symbols. A lot has been done even before this bill was passed. And maybe we could review that, right? And the Democratic Memorial did a great task also to boost all these measures. Also, I would like to consider that the Rodriguez Zapatero bill on historic memory was a big step forward, insufficient, but a first step forward that one should embrace. And it's, I would say, a positive expression of the Spanish parliament to go ahead in terms of historic memory. We need to embrace them. We need to appropriate them and transform them if necessary. And, you know, I did use my tools to withdraw flags myself back in the 70s. So. I believe all the work that has been done from the government needs to be underlined. Since we established the Democratic Memorial, quite a lot has been done. And I believe city councils have also contributed to this task, and even more so the civil society. Before the Democratic Memorial was set up, many civil society organizations worked to recover our democratic memory, to intervene in our region, etc. So I would say that the key point here, and in, if in Catalonia we have moved even farther than in other regions of Spain, it's because the government is placing quite a lot of stake in there but also the civil society organizations. For example, it's been stuck for a few years thanks to the work carried out by city councils. And I believe this is important to understand why in Catalonia we are doing a little bit better than in other places, even if we face limitations and challenges, for sure. Um. Can I be rude? Is it allowed in Spain? <laughs> I'm really very disappointed um, with the presentation because it seems to me that what's happening here is very introverted. First of all, the dialogue has been candidly very parochial. It's about Catalan problems, and you're in London, and I don't know why you don't have these discussions. Maybe it's a dynamic here that's useful to you to be more candid than you can be at home. But I presented to Oriol and um, Kamui um, our book about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what we tried to do with that book was not to look back and have a memory. We wanted to move forward. 
and I think you were touching on this. The memory is, it's nostalgia, you know, it's, a, it's an industry as well, I have to say. Memory is an industry for many people. What we're really about is trying to create a more peaceful world, and it's mission impossible, we think, you know, when we read the news today, for example. But what I found this morning um, disappointing, I will only say, first of all, welcome to London. It's very nice to see you here. I don't know your part of Spain, and I'd love to go. I'm also, I'm also a Republican at heart. But I think if we're going to move forward, what we d the, the undertaking with the Hiroshima Nagasaki book was to try to understand why the Japanese behaved so badly, which in turn allowed the Americans to behave so badly to bomb Japan. And I looked back and what I saw, I'd been to Nagasaki in 1974 and I'd been in Spain in 1970 and I was, and I'm a Catholic by birth, um, not by inclination, but what happened was that we Europeans went to Asia and starting with the Spanish and the Portuguese, quickly followed by the British and the Dutch and we behaved unspeakably badly with the sanction of the popes. Two great bulls um, really gave our buccaneers, as we call them, the uh, liberty to misbehave. So when we talk about the Japanese, you, I think it's right to say the Spanish didn't suffer particularly from Japanese cruelty, is it correct? I mean, other people did, but you didn't. So for many other people, their memories of Japanese unkindness and, and, and gross cruelty. But what, what we did, and I was taking some uh, criticism for this, I said, why did the Japanese behave so badly? And I think I showed the mayor earlier on um, one cartoon from a French newspaper. Yeah, sure, sorry. Unfortunately, I can't stay this afternoon, not all afternoon anyway. But I'm just asking you, please, um, because I don't have time to uh, labor this point, if some of the energy that went into memory and, and the memory industry, to put it bluntly, if some of that energy went into understanding the nationalists, why, why did Franco behave so badly? Why, why were they so cruel? That would be a very interesting seminar to come to, and I, you're quite capable of doing that. So next time, if it's here or in, in Catalonia, let's talk about reconciliation. And reconciliation can only come from understanding the opposition. We have to love our enemies, you know, whether we're Christians or not. We have to love our enemies. And memory doesn't seem to be about loving our enemies. It seems to be about uh, elaborating the pay, our pain, but not understanding their pain. They had pain too. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't mean to be impolite, but I want to be helpful in asking you to jump out of memory into the future. I must bring Joanne back first. See, um, uh, interessante. That's a very interesting debate. That's a very interesting point, absolutely. A society like the Spanish society or the Catalan society, when we try and understand our historic memory, we do it by trying to understand that the civil war was won by the fascists here in London. Maybe things can be seen from another perspective because the fascists were uh, beaten, but we know that fascism spent 40 years in Spain to, let's say, rebuild their memories. So Democrats, Republicans, those who were beaten, we need a time to recover. The Spanish democracy in 40 times, in 40 years, sorry, should have carried out all this memory task. But unfortunately, it has not been the case. Some measures have been under, undertaken, but it's not enough. And that's why memory policies are still essential in order to precisely reconcile, as you were saying, a reconciliation that we look forward to. But I believe reconciliation is not possible without previous justice. Without justice, it's very difficult to move forward. I totally agree in the sense that reconciliation doesn't happen when there's pain and when both sides are not equal or balanced in treatment. I don't think memory is nostalgia. Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it is, but not always. 
and I would like to refer to some papers published in the year 2011 as a result of a workshop that took place in Paris organized by several universities called Pourquoi ce souvenir? Why remembering? Many, many articles. And I would like to summarize all these articles by quoting the late Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco said that memory is, un memory is not necessarily nostalgia, but rather memory allows, un allows us to understand individually and collectively where we come from, and memory will allow us to understand where we are and where we are headed. And I believe it's here where all these memory policies needs to let's say, look ahead also, not only backwards. We need to include different perspectives into these memory policies, because reconciliation is not possible if the wounds are still alive, or at least on one side, because for the last 45 years, we've only heard silence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Guido Vaglio, I'm the director of, um, of a museum of the resistance and Second World War in uh, Torino, Italy. <coughs> uh, l last week, uh, for the International Museum Day, we organized with ICOM, uh, re the regional committee of ICOM, uh, a workshop about uh, the difficult or dissonant heritage. And uh, I think that we all, dealing with the 20th century, have to, to face dissonant or difficult memories and heritage. I think that, well, you, you are right when you say we don't have to, to be nostalgic and look only at the past. <laughs> You're right. I think that the problem is that all uh, museums or, or, or other institutions dealing with the 20th century are in, in a balance between memory and history. And we, we are in this moment for the Second World War in, in a sort of a turning point. All direct witness, witnesses are disappearing and so on. Um, I think that the solution can be the, the, to have more history uh, uh, and, and to, to look, but knowing that the... Um, if, if we have to, to do with a non-shared memory, because in Italy still that period is, is not the object of, of a shared, actually shared memory, but the solution, um, I think, is, is, is the history and is uh, to understand that what, what happened in, in those years uh, is, uh, is very important for to explain and to understand what we are today. Uh, and, and this was a bit the idea of our museum. Thank you. I will go in Catalan, if I may. Um, I would like to ask both speakers the debate in Catalonia and the debate in the parliament about the new Catalan law of memory, does it take into account the need to build a shared collective memory among all Europeans? I think this is a challenge that we are facing all the peoples of Europe of trying to go and advance in this same line in order to be able to understand the complexity of history. Is it really necessary that Catalonia and Spain, was it necessary to be 40 years until under dictatorships to stop the Soviets coming from the East? This is important for Catalan people, but also for Spanish and European people. All together, we are all responsible for history. And this is just an example of what we should try to do among us, trying to build this collective and shared memory and 
maybe this European, Europeanist label in this debate. Are we aware in Catalonia and in Spain that we need to build this shared memory? Do we take into account the memories of the rest of peoples of Europe? Are we able to build this shared memory? Thank you. Uh, just before I bring the speakers back, I'd like to thank the translators who've done an excellent job. I think it should be a round of applause, maybe. Uh, <laughs>